Well, hello, Lisa. Let me tell you, I have been looking forward to this interview for a very, very long time. So I'm so grateful for you being here with me and my community of listeners. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be talking to you. I really, I was looking forward to it. I am glad. Well, we're mutual, mutual admirers, but <laughs> are changing the face of medicine for women. You know, again, yeah. you're bringing it out in such a way. I, I, our standard of medicine um, daily practices probably will take, you know, quite a, another, at least another decade, if not more, to catch up with your work. And yeah. the fact that you're bringing it out in um, your first book, Brain Food. Yes. Brain and then the XX factor or the XX? The XX brain is my next book. I actually just finished writing it and it's coming out in March of 2020. So I'm really excited about that. It's really about my research on women's brains and all the risk factors that are really important to address in terms of women's brains health right? And all the things that we should do and all the things that we should not do, but specifically for women. So I'm really, I'm really excited that gender medicine is finally embracing the brain mm -hmm. as well as our ovaries and breasts. You know, I think that there's been this constant um, denial that there's more to women than just the reproductive organs. So I think it's really important that we're talking about brains. You know, I always love to say as a gynecologist, I'm like, you know, it's all connected. It's all connected. We can't just look at yeah. the vagina, honestly. Let's be honest. <laughs> and why would it not be? That, that's, that's really what's been puzzling to me for so long. I, am, I have a dual PhD in neuroscience and nuclear medicine, which is really, you know, the brain being seen in many different ways and using all these different tools. And when I was in school and we were talking about my accent, so I, I just Tell uh, us clarify. Yeah, as you said, I'll just clarify for everyone. <laughs> so I was born and raised in Florence, in Italy, but I went to a French high school. So I think, you know, Italian is my first language and French is my second language. So English is my third and it suffers uh, because of the other two. <laughs> But yeah, that's my, that's my accent. And I, I've been really looking into women's brains um, ever since I went to university because I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease in my family. Obviously, my grandmother had, she suffered and passed away due to a pretty aggressive form of Alzheimer's, although late, like old age Alzheimer's. And then her two younger sisters, developed exactly the same form of dementia when they were the same age as my grandma as they got older and reached the same age when my grandmother started showing the symptoms of dementia so did they whereas their brother did not so for me it was a little bit of a whoa what's going on kind of moment for my mother of course as well so we really my mom is a nuclear physicist so she, and so is my father, which is really interesting. Both my parents are nuclear physicists and that's how I got into nuclear medicine, right? Thanks to, to them in a way. But then we really started thinking about our brains. So I didn't, and when do we need to start taking care of our brains? Do, should you wait until you have symptoms? Should you start when you're in your 20s? Back then, because it was almost 20 years ago at this point, and there was so much confusion about Alzheimer's and dementia. There was so much stigma around it, especially as far as women are concerned, right? Every time a woman says, I can't remember things, boom, your PMS. Or, well, it's got to be your hormones. Or maybe it's menopause. Or maybe you should sleep more, right? Or maybe you should just take a deep breath and take an antidepressant. And that's been forever. So it's been really a long journey for me. I went to school right away. I went to neuroscience and I've been studying the brain ever since. So it's been a long, it's been, yeah. been a long journey. Mm -hmm. and, and just focusing. So it, I'm really excited, especially too, about your next book, The XX Brain, because it, it works differently than 
um, then when, you know, it works differently and at different times of our life too. And I think that's yeah. really critical. And it was interesting. There's a magazine, a New York magazine called in New York magazine, the section cutter that looked at schizophrenia in the perimenopausal yeah. woman. Yes. And and something that I always, I, I jokingly say, but you know, you'll always hear someone say, well, you know, she has bipolar. I'm like, is it bipolar or is it hormonal? And the actual reality is, what are we using for fuel? So I'm going to share a couple slides and I'm going to share a couple of your slides, actually. I know. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> I am. Well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to spring it on you because we didn't talk about that I was going to do this. <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. Well, then maybe I'll do the same to you. I'll pop up some slides. I have one that I think you might like. So you show me my slides and I'll show you more. Deal, deal. All right. So um, for, for the, we're going to talk through it for those of you that are listening and during the podcast too. Um, for those of you that are watching, it's a, this is a great video to watch too. We play this on YouTube. And if you're listening, you can always come back and see it on YouTube uh, on my channel or at Dr. Anna Kabeca. As couch talk page, so my couch talk page, and then you can see that Lisa is growing a village in her background. There's a toy village. <laughs> Lisa, his daughter, she negotiated. There's a unicorn. You got. You just got to come watch them. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot about the unicorn. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. In our home, unicorn. Yes. <laughs> so we'll share that. But I want to show. I want to show this sign. This is one of my slides now. Lisa, this is not to scale, this is not proportionate to serum levels, but to give you an idea of for me, the importance of hormones in our physiology as we're aging. So one thing that I've always recognized was this, this work, this here, the progesterone decline, as well as estrogen decline, really for progesterone declining mid thirties to 55, right? We see this huge dip. And during this time, we see a tremendous amount of symptoms. We associate it often with estrogen dominance you know, the PMS, the weight gain, the brain fog, the um, certainly irregular cycles. We see other physiologic occurrences such as, you know, bone loss, the vaginal dryness, the loss of libido, the weight gain, the weight loss resistance. We also see insomnia, anxiety. And during this time frame is a period which, you know, like we would agree is neurologically vulnerable. So it's a period of neuroendocrine vulnerability, neurologic vulnerability. And what happens to women during this time period, they're getting anti-anxiety medications, right? They're getting anti-anxiety medications. They're getting antidepressants. They're getting sleep medications, benzodiazepines. And then later on, because of, you know, bladder issues, they're getting anticholinergic medications. These three, each one of them is associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's, right? Yes. Put them together and what are we doing to the female brain? But now this is where I found, this is your slide. <laughs> this slide is brilliant. For me, this was such an eye-opening moment because when I got into my keto green way, right? When I got into my keto green way, understanding that I needed to get alkaline and then get into ketosis, not only did I lose weight and balance my hormones, but the brain clarity, this, I call it, you know, spiritual enlightenment, this energized enlightenment came through to me to enable mm -hmm. me to make better decisions, reclaim my memory that was feeling lost. And so do you want to go through what your findings are here uh, on this slide or? Right. So basically what we have shown in, there's been a lot of work done to really understand how hormonal changes affect the brain in women, but most of the work was done in animals. And mice, for example, don't actually go through menopause. You have to give them an oophorectomy, you have to cut out the ovaries to trigger menopause in mice. So it's nothing like what women go through pretty much, right? I mean, there's a huge difference between a mice model of anything and the actual uh, disease or condition in, in humans. Um, but there, there was already an understanding that menopause affects brain energy levels and specifically glucose metabolism, which is, so glucose is the primary fuel for the brain in terms of energy. And um, estrogen is a massive regulator in the female brain. And one of the many functions that estrogen has is to really um, improve or stimulate glucose uptake in the brain and therefore glucose transport into the mitochondria and therefore ATP production. So in other words, estrogen makes your brain 
produce energy. So if you don't have estrogen or progesterone for what matters, you know, as we look at estrogens, plural, like all female hormones working as a whole. So when your hormones are in tune, your brain is very energized. But when, you're, when your hormones are off balance, then women show a drop in metabolic activity inside the brain. And so some work was done in animals. We have done it with actual women, human brain. You know, we, I do a lot of brain imaging. My background is in nuclear medicine. And I'm in New York City. There's, there's <laughs> all the time. But yeah, so we have shown that if you take a population of men and women who are 40 to 60 years old, and you give them a number of brain scans to look at um, their neurons, do they have neurons in their brains and how well are these neurons working and do they have Alzheimer's plaques or not, then the men are pretty much okay. But if you look at the women, uh, if you're premenopausal, you're broadly as good as a man's brain, right? Your brain is almost as highly energized as a man's brain of the same age. But then as women go through menopause, there is a drop in energy activity inside the brain. And there's really the onset of Alzheimer's plaques inside the brain. It looks like when they're starting to accumulate and that gets worse as women go through post-menopause, through menopause and post-menopause. So there's a little, when you show the little drop of, of the red uh, line. Mm -hmm. So that was really shocking to me personally. Um, so my background is in neuroscience. I've been working in psychiatry and neurology for pretty much my entire career. And we don't tend to associate our hormones or menopause at least with changes in the brain. It's a little bit of a stretch in thinking that, that we need to, to make. Um, and like you were saying, you know, everything is connected and that should be obvious to everybody, but it's not. Somehow it's surprising and I, I, I suffer from the bias as, as a scientist. And then I started looking into that and the research really led me to launch the Women's Brain Initiative at Wild Cornette Medical College, where I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a professor there. I'm also the Associate Director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic at Wild Cornell. So the two things combined were incredibly helpful in um, doing more and more research on women's brains and why these changes they were not actually aware of as doctors and clinicians or even scientists for, for what matters can potentially um, trigger Alzheimer's disease in a woman's brain when we are in our 40s and 50s, not the 70s. So it's really a little bit of a, um, these findings really led a lot of people to rethink Alzheimer's disease and especially women's risk of Alzheimer's. And also I should say the reason this is important is that many people are not aware that there is a strong gender disparity in Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So for, for every, out of every three Alzheimer's patients, two are women. And that's pretty much all over the world is, that we have data for. And whenever I mention that, usually the answer I get is that, well, that's because women live longer, right? So it's not even a question worth looking into because you live long, you guys live longer. And so of course you get Alzheimer's more, but this work really shows that the, the point is not that we live longer, which actually we don't. If you think about it, there's maybe a four years gap. Like in the United States, women tend to live maybe four and a half years more than men. In like in England, women live two years longer than men, but still Alzheimer's is the number one cause of death for women and not for men in England. And there's still the same two to one ratio. So uh, the problem we believe is that women develop Alzheimer's earlier. Mm -hmm. And that eventually leads to the higher prevalence. Well, I think it's, it's so fascinating. When I saw this, you know, and I, that first of all, that there are gender strong, strong, not just gender disparities, but strong gender disparities, right? A two to one. Yes. Yes, right. to one ratio. Mm -hmm. That's huge. And so we have to look like, okay, well, why? And, you know, again, looking at this, the drop in progesterone, I really think that's a big deal. Lisa, I really think we're going to have to look into that more too, as long with the estrogen, because compare the flow, right? And that yeah. difference, like we know that it requires estrogen to use glucose for the brain fuel, right? Yeah. And 
so, so my whole thing and, and, and with your um, brain food, it's like, you know, glucose is to gasoline, right? All gas yes. as ketones are to jet fuel. And so <laughs> from glucose to ketones, at least intermittently, is going to hugely, and it does, it hugely helps the symptoms that are associated here. And, and some of these symptoms that you listed were, were ang you know, the anxiety, the insomnia, the depression, the mood swings, the brain fog, the memory loss, all of that shifted by changing from glucose to um, ketones, right? Ketones. Yeah, there's a, there's a shift, absolutely, yeah. But I think it's a it's a huge issue that just completely unaddressed by anyone. Like doctors don't know about it. Nutritionists don't necessarily know what's happening in the brain. And um, no, you. But when you go to like an OBGYN, like when you go to a reproductive medicine doctor, they don't really think about the brain as much. So it's it's a or about diet. So it's a little bit of a combination of factors. I think a, an integrative medicine approach would help tremendously right just the combination Absolutely. of different disciplines and of course research to better understand mm -hmm. what to do and when mm -hmm. right? what is the window of opportunity to make changes and i i don't think the window of opportunity ever closes mm -hmm. right there's always time it's never too late you just really need to take action and be consistent over time yeah. And I think that's really valuable. I, I think, what age do you see these symptoms, like the decrease in glucose utilization or glucose metabolism in the brain? What age does that, are you seeing that initiate? So that's, that's an important question. And I think it depends on, so for women who are going through menopause naturally, then that's actually, we see before menopause during the perimenopausal stage and for in our population it varies between as early as 42 so you can find it when, when women are in their early 40s um, but if you actually go through menopause because of surgery um, then it's any age you know you could be 30 as long as you get a you know, hysterectomy or an OVX, then there are clear changes in the brain. Then I, I think need, they need addressing. Like we've known since, I think it was 2004, the first time that somebody showed that um, unilateral, more so bilateral ophorectomy, so the surgical removal of one or two ovaries, can increase risk of Alzheimer's in women by up to 70% as oh, you great. prepare for this. That's, that's a huge, that's a huge amount. So having one ovary, one or two ovaries removed, even one ovary removed is up to 70% 70, 70 increased risk. That's for two. 70% for two risk can go up to 70%, but even when just one, yes, and less, you know, is lower with just the unilateral OVX, but it's still a, a proper increase in risk. And women are just not counseled in these terms, right? Nobody tells mm -hmm. you that having your ovaries removed or if you take medicines that can block your ovaries, like cancer medication like tamoxifen, estrogen blockers, aromatase inhibitors, what kind of effect do they have on your brain on top of your ovaries? What kind of effect do they have on your heart, mm -hmm. right? There's so little that's been done to really research that uh, consistently. And that's why I, I wrote my next book. So the XX brain, I really go into detail in the research, what we know, what we don't yet know, but you know, what, what the evidence so far is pointing to and why these needs to be addressed. Like I'm really trying to, with the Women's Brain Initiative and with my work and uh, we're partnering with Maria Shriver's Women Alzheimer's Movements. They're huge advocates of women's health and Alzheimer's. And we're really trying to raise awareness that we need more information. We need actual evidence-based, sound, clinically tested, recommendations that we can give to women because women's brains do not age the same way the men's brains age and by age I don't mean 
70, 80, 90 just changes over time from puberty until, you know, age 120, hopefully. Yeah. So we really need to come together. I think Maria Shriver actually always says that women are at the epicenter of the problem and women really need to come up with a solution. And I think it's such a, just such a strong, powerful thing to say. And I also think it's so true because it's, it's our problem, right? And we can't wait for Prince Charming to come and fix it for us. It just doesn't <laughs> work like that. We really need to, we need to figure it out. I, I think that's so important. You know, you think hysterectomy, so BSO increasing our risk of Alzheimer would never have thought of that, number one. And nor did I know yeah. to counsel my patients um, on that. And secondly, I wonder, birth control pills affecting the ovaries, is, you know, is that yeah. something that could be affecting increasing our risk of Alzheimer's as well? I looked into that. It's a very good question. And I was doing all the research for the XX brain. And so far, there is no strong evidence right. that birth control increases Alzheimer's risk. I like to say there's also not much research, really. There's not a lot of work that's been done to really find an association between the two things. What seems more consistent, what was being found instead is that birth control can affect your mood especially IUDs. So if you do have a predisposition towards depression, it seems like it brings it up more in some women, not all women, but it may increase your, your risk of actually developing depression. Mm. Okay, that's fascinating. So let's go back into the brain. Can you write it down? Yes, <laughs> I'm, writing, it down. I'm, I'm writing it down. <laughs> I'm just, you know, looking at those associations. This is fascinating. I love this stuff, Lisa. Thank you yeah. so much. But so also, uh, the ophorectomy, right? We know that it increases risk of Alzheimer's, but also really increases risk of depression. Oh, ophorectomy increases risk of depression, increases so, risk of heart, heart disease, cardiovascular mortality is increased by as much as if yeah. 25 yeah. to 50%. Yeah. Yeah. So um, back into the brain, what's happening? So some of your research has shown the difference. Again, what's what's adding to this diversity between the female and male brain? So um, estrogen, progesterone, uh, estrogen in a woman's brain versus yes. estrogen in a man's brain. Mm -hmm. There isn't much estrogen in a man's brain, right? M men are more testosterone driven and as they get older, testosterone can still be converted into estrogen, whereas doesn't, and women just lose their estrogen, just go to menopause. Women lose estradiol more, right? And when, usually, at least for us, when we talk about estrogen, we actually mean estradiol, which is like the most uh, powerful of hormones. We still have the backup form of hormone, but that doesn't seem to be as helpful. So what we have shown is that, and what we, we see all the time, we started with, maybe 60 women in the study, and now we have hundreds and hundreds, which is fantastic. Um, th there are changes in the brain. About 80% of women report uh, neurological symptoms during menopause. We don't call them neurological, but they do start in the brain, not in the ovaries. So neurologists should be aware that hot flashes and night sweats, insomnia, um, memory fog, cognitive slippage, Increased stress, even like you reduce tolerance to stress, reduce inflammation. They all reduce inflammation. That's about everything else starts in the brain, right? So th this is really something that um, led at least me to rethink women's health in some ways. Because if you look at a woman through the lens of women's health, you might look at her breasts, you might look for cancer in the ovaries and the cervix, you might check the heart put in with an AKG when we're going through menopause, but there's nothing done to really provide women with a solid brain check. But we know that menopause increases risk of Alzheimer's and dementia in women. It's always been known that after aging itself, female sex is the major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, right? We know that. We don't know what to do about it, or we're starting to actually know what to do about it, which is, which is really the good news. There's now 
um, a lot of work has been done to really clarify that Alzheimer's disease is not necessarily genetically driven, right? So there's like, there are genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's, but that's, those are found in less than 1% of the population. And even if you look at all the families that are affected by Alzheimer's disease, about 7% of families have genetic mutations and everybody else does not. So there's something, of course, to be said about genetic vulnerability or genetic risk factors that are the same that make your eyes beautiful brown green and my eyes are blue, right? So there's genetic variability in the same genetic variability may make somebody more likely to get Alzheimer's as compared to somebody else, but they do not cause Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of other factors like medical, hormonal, of course, and lifestyle factors that increase risk of Alzheimer's in, in an enormous amount of the population. And the latest news is that these risk factors actually vary by gender. So the reason the women get Alzheimer's for different reasons than men, or there are different pathways towards Alzheimer's for men and women, depending on what our risk factors are. And for women, they're more related to metabolism and hormonal health. Whereas for women, for men, they seem to, they seem to be more related to heart health, the cardiovascular stressors. That's fascinating too, to look at that. And so what can be done about it? What are some of the top brain foods? What are, what are the strategies that every individual needs to be um, you know, implementing right now? Yes, so I would say the pillars of Alzheimer's prevention are really, um, you need to pay attention to your heart. So cardiovascular health, uh, making sure that you manage diabetes, possibly that you don't get diabetes or insulin resistance. Uh, obesity, uh, depression in midlife is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease in both men and women, but um, is the strongest risk factor in women specifically. And it's not the kind of depression that you necessarily need to treat with antidepressants, right? It's mostly hormonal depression or hormonal mood swings, probably related to changes uh, between peri and postmenopause. Then hormonal health, of course, for women. And then we have diet, exercise, intellectual activity, social engagement, sleep, and stress reduction. Mm. I think most people agree that these are the most, um, they're the major risk, factor for, risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And pretty much all of them increase Alzheimer's risk in women more than in men. Mm. So we really need to address these. Some of the risk factors you have to work with the doctor. Can you say that again, Lisa? You said these, so we've said cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, or diabetes, depression, midlife, especially women greater yeah. than men, and then diet, exercise, sociability. So diet, exercise, intellectual stimulation or intellectual activity, social engagement, uh, smoking is something that women especially need to avoid. And then I believe I said sleep and stress reduction. Mm, sleep and stress reduction. Okay, perfect. Yes. yes. Good, 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 good. So those are all areas that are free to manage for most of us, right? Those yeah. Are it's easier said than done. In some cases, it really easier said than done. Like I'm on two hours of sleep because my husband snored <laughs> all night last <laughs> night. And so, of course, I suffer from it. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, that is not so sustainable. Much. We're going to have to fix his sleep, so his snoring, so you can sleep. Oh, my gosh. He's, he's trying. He's doing his best. Absolutely. No, he's fantastic. He's really super helpful. I think, um, yes, yeah, so there are modifiable risk factors, right? There are things we can't change, like your age, your family, your DNA. For now, we can't change any of that, your, your ethnicity. But then everything else is really under, can be controlled and can be managed. And in many cases, it can really be eliminated, like completely eliminated. Like smoking, it's got to go. It's mm -hmm. got to go. It's the number one cause of ovarian, ovarian failure and infertility. And whatever impacts ovaries so badly also puts you in menopause early. Earlier, like average age, you know, in your early 40s. And menopause. Yeah, I was right. just saying it can be as much as 10 years earlier for menopause in smoke. It's shocking. It's, and there is no reason to do that. No. There's really no benefit 
to smoking, but so many women smoke. Like um, I started noticing more and more recently and I'm walking in New York City and many people are kind of health conscious in New York. But yeah, people smoke like by the street. They're just walking around with a cigarette. I was like, wow. Mm. Same in Italy. A lot of people smoke in Italy. Yeah, Italians love their cigarettes. <laughs> but then so diet then comes in so handy, right? So important because the only way to counteract the effects of smoking and free radical productions and oxidative stress is by really um, consuming antioxidants. So the brain is the one organ of the body that has the lowest antioxidant capacity. So it gets oxidized incredibly fast. And really we need to, to bring all the antioxidants in for the brain to be able to counteract the effects of aging and oxidative stress. So um, I, I know you talk about that in your book. Yeah, absolutely. But it can't talk about it enough. So speaking of that too, I'm going to share with you this, you see this slide of your, this is oh, your website. This is my website. <laughs> the fact that you have dark chocolate on here with maybe rose hips. Oh my gosh. Like I, I just yeah. loved you even more when I saw <laughs> I, this is a keto green salad. Was that tuna, lots of greens, avocado, healthy fats, good um, blend, lots of colors. I mean, just a beautiful presentation. So I was so happy to see this and share this. So for everyone who's listening, check out lisamoscone.com, lisamoscone.com, L-I-S-A-M-O-C-O-M-O-S, sorry, Lisa, you spell it for me. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's L-I-S-A-M-O-S, C as in Charlie, O-N as in Nancy, I.com. Lisa Moscone. Yeah, and, and then, it is chocolate. Yes. Well, dark chocolate um, is such a good source of antioxidants. Like theobromine is a fantastic yes. substance that is also a vasodilator. So it gives you a little bit of the stimulant effect of caffeine without giving you the jitters. And at the same time, it improves blood flow to the brain and also really helps balance out insulin levels so it's helpful for people with um, insulin resistance that is it has to be really dark like 85 percent or higher and with very little sugar so it's not necessarily a, and, and i'm not talking about candy just no right, right. <laughs> although you know yes it, it is so good so really 85 percent we can't do that 80 percent yeah so, yeah yeah 80 percent Okay, okay, we're good. We're good. We're still friends. All right. I made that one. I made that chocolate that you were showing. Did you really? Okay, mm -hmm. so you're going to have to share that recipe. So we will yes. post that recipe too. Now, I want to share um, this research that you did. You know, you did research imaging the brain. And this is fascinating. And this, the MRI of the brain, because, you know, like we talk about this in psychiatry. Psychiatry is the only area of medicine where we don't image the organ we're studying. And that yeah. has to change. That has to change. But like, and this is so important with the brain. So I would love for you to, to talk about this. Yeah. And um, yeah, share with us what this is showing. I mean, Right. So this is the pet first scan. time. These are PET scans. So these are positron emission tomography scans that look at brain activity. So this is really, we use the tracer that is basically glucose, is a sugar, is labeled with a compound called fluorine 18, which is slightly mildly radioactive. So it goes in your brain and then the brain thinks that that's sugar. And so it starts burning the sugar, but the F18 gets trapped in tissue and this starts literally shooting out x-ray like gamma rays of light out of the machine and so then we can take a picture of the light that is coming out of a person's brain and then do some fancy mathematical transformations that create an image of how metabolically active the brain is and here's the story so this is the first woman we imaged when she was a premenopausal um patient so to speak so she had no signs of menopause she was in her 40s she was doing fantastic and so was her brain right so this is a good looking brain the one to the left brain activity is nice and bright you want your brain to be all in the red yellow range especially at the top of the brain right there so that's the frontal cortex which is in charge of thinking and reasoning and language and planning and um, you want the brain to be isometabolic 
So you want the left side to be as bright as the, as the right side. And you also want uh, the, the bottom of the brain in the middle. Yes, thank you, right there, to be nice and bright. That is the posterior cingulate and precuneus, which are really in charge of autobiographical memory. It basically tells you, like, my name is so-and-so, today I'm working from home, and yesterday I went to the office, and three years ago I was doing this and that. So this is very powerful, this is important, that these, these parts of your brain really work well and they're very energized. And then we, we kept working with this woman over time and we always repeat her brain scans every two years and then four years and six years for as long as the patient will stay with us. And as she went through menopause, her brain really changed in a big way, which is the scan to the right. I think you can see how the red turned into yellow and the yellow turned into green and everything is much more green than red. Right, and this is just in maybe seven years span. This is a 50% drop in metabolic activity in the brain. I can't hear you anymore. And this is, okay, this is so interesting. Okay. Oh, there we go, I had myself muted. The, um, this is so interesting because I want everyone listening who have, who's suffered with brain fog, memory issues to recognize, like, you can't just think yourself better, right? There's physiology behind this that yeah. is creating a decrease, a, a compromise, this period of neurologic vulnerability in the brain, this compromise. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, this critical memory recall, um, uh, you know, centers of the brain. Planning, uh, yes. You lost really it. Yeah, like patients would yeah. say all the time, I lost my edge. I used to be able to organize everything and now I can't stay organized or, yeah. you know, I, I'm just, I'm losing it. So this is yeah. just a beautiful illustration of that. It's a scary just, one. It's a really scary one. I, w I was really quite shocked when I saw that. Um, so this, this is not actually an extreme example. This is quite average. And of course, this is just one person. It means nothing for the population. And so what we did was to go ahead and, and look at hundreds. So at this point, we really have more than 300 uh, people in the study with, with this kind of brains. Keep seeing this over and over and over again. It's like there's a drop in energy level. Then that kind of stabilizes. You know, for, for many women, uh, maybe it's reversible. We don't know. Maybe it just plateaus at some point and then your brain readjusts and reassess which is perfectly plausible about um i would say these changes are found in about 80 percent of women which is also consistent with the i know it sucks but is also consistent with um the clinical observations that 20 percent of women show basically don't suffer from menopause they have no hot flashes no nice stress no nothing they're totally fine Whereas 80% of women have some brain signs of menopause. Some women only have high flushes, but most women have a combination of things. And so we are now looking into whether we can capture these different patterns using the brain scans. Like there's probably um, the 20% of women whose brains remain pretty much stable over time. And they also have no signs of um, the brain being a little bit discombobulated, if you will. And then perhaps there's a speci specific pattern for women who only have hot flashes or night sweats and nothing else. And then there may be another pattern for women who have the hot flashes and also memory loss or some cognitive slippage and, and an increased risk of Alzheimer's. So we're really trying to, to phenotype um, the brain menopause if you will, which is mm -hmm. difficult to do. And there's something I want to tell you because I, I know you're going to be excited about this. One of the problems I have with women's health as a field is that we're treating women without having the information we need to actually make that judgment call. So we can measure hormones in blood, like you, sh you showed, right? We can measure, measure them in plasma. We can, there is no correlation between your hormones in blood and the hormones in your head. There are two separate systems that speak to each other. But if your hormones change, are changing in your blood because your ovaries are changing, it doesn't mean that your brain is changing at the same time. And the problem is that while we can measure hormones in blood, we can't measure it in the brain. 
Mm-hmm. Like all these women who are taking HRT by hormonal replacement therapy, estrogen replacement therapy, serums, all the new therapies, these, these clinical trials are not able to test what they should be testing, which is the effect of these drugs on the brain. Because we have no tools, we have no machines that allow us to measure estrogens or progesterone in the brain. So what I think you're going to be excited about is that we are developing the tool right now. Uh, well, tell and me, what I'm is this tool? Yes. It's a tracer. It's a tracer. It's a tracer for positron emission tomography that goes inside the brain and basically works it's estradiol. It's estradiol that will go inside the brain and then bind to the estrogen receptors in the brain. And then we're going to get little pictures like this image that we just showed for metabolic activity. But instead of looking at the effects of estrogen binding in the brain in terms of glucose changes, we're going to be able to actually quantify how much estradiol is going inside your brain and how much of that binds to your receptors because the problem in a brain is is whether or not the receptors are working Mm -hmm. right and we have no information because nobody's ever done it which is to me it's it's offensive i think right women right i mean so many women are taking hormones and we know that hormones have an effect on the brain and nobody has ever Look at that. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Heck, it's hard, enough to get us, it's hard enough to get us physicians to test hormones. So, so this is huge. This is amazing. Yeah. And I keep thinking, so if you're going to be able to put a tracer, an estradiol, you know, a tracer, so estradiol with a tracer, look at where it's, it's um, um, targeting in the brain, right? You'll be able mm-hmm. to see where it's yeah. targeting. And then you'll be able to see the shift because you're doing PET and glucose utilization to see if it's instantaneous or is it long-term? Yeah. And it, does it burn out after time? I, I'm fascinated. Do progesterone too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> One at a time. <laughs> I know. Well, let's add in progesterone. I think it's such a big factor. But tell me this one thing, because I'm just curious and I can't move on until I get you to answer this question. <laughs> what is this area of the brain? Because that doesn't seem to change much in the pre-menopause to the post-menopause. Is the thalamus. Thalamus and putamen and, and, and caudate putamen and thalamus. So this is, is called the striatum. And it's a part of the brain that is very important for uh, relaying information between different parts of the brain. So the brain is divided into systems. There's a limbic system that is more primitive, and then there's the neocortex that is more recent. And the thalamus is really kind of the dispatcher. It really, you know, it's, it kind of, it gets information from all different parts of the brains to send them back to the huh. parts that need to receive the, inf- the information. So that part is not changing as far as we can tell. That's fascinating. So that means the recovery. That's fascinating. So that means the recovery of the brain should be adaptable. Mm-hmm. So have you then imaged this postmenopausal woman, woman on a, a ketogenic diet or in a state of ketosis or fasting? No, we, we have not. So we have, um, there are a few of our subject, of our patients who are on keto diets. I think the the best way to test it would be to do a clinical trial that looks specifically into that because observational studies are always complicated, right? You want to standardize, you want to make sure that they're really following the diet you want them to follow. And um, so we're not currently doing that, but it would be interesting. It would be, it would be fascinating because, um, you know, in just sharing the dietary changes, like again, this is another one of your slides, your pictures. So the Mediterranean diet versus the Western diet, more atrophy in a brain on the Western diet. Yes, yes, we see that also all the time. And um, so the Mediterranean diet, and I'm slightly biased just a little bit, but, I, but in truth, it's really the one diet that's been shown to work very well for women at least from a scientific point of view. It's been tested over and over again, and it seems to work well. And it's, a, it's mostly plant-based, like you have your green um, focus in your, in your diet plan, and it contains like, 
good amounts of veggies and fruit, but also legumes and whole grains. I mean, everybody knows what the Mediterranean diet is like, but also fish, right? It's a big component, healthy fats, based on quality rather than quantity. And it's been shown to work quite well on women. So women following this diet have um, three times longer telomeres. You know, telomeres are like biological indicators of aging. So the longer they are, the younger your cells are, which is good news. They also have a 25% lower risk of heart disease and stroke. They have a 50% lower risk of breast cancer. They have about 20% uh, reduced risk of hot flashes even. And most importantly, most importantly, their brains look younger. So if you compare um, women on a Mediterranean-style diet with women on a Western diet, which I think everybody agrees is not a healthy diet, then the Western dieters um, show much faster brain aging. There's a, almost an acceleration of brain aging that equals to an extra five years worth of aging as compared to people who eat healthier. So this is quite a thing to, to look into. I think you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. The Mediterranean diet is associated with three times longer telomeres. Yes. So that's anti-aging. 25% yes. decreased risk of heart disease and stroke. And stroke. 50%. 50% reduction in breast cancer, 50%? 50%, yes. Wow. 50% lower risk of breast cancer as compared to Western dieters. That is, yeah. that's fascinating. And then Those are big cancer. numbers. Yes, I had to Those read are... them, of course, because I'll never remember them. But yes, these are, these are quite consistent. They're, they're quite consistent. And these are, these are studies that include like thousands and thousands of women, like the one showing 25% reduced risk of heart disease and stroke is done in 78,000 women. So it's quite a strong finding. And yes. So it's not like 10 women and, you know, four doing that. It's really 78,000. So I, I, I tend to trust that. Yeah, that's huge. That is huge. That is concrete. We call that concrete data, right? Concrete. Yeah. Big data. Yeah. <laughs> And so one thing that I've heard, so, you know, our brain, in our brain, we have circulating estrogen. And so um, I think it was Dr. Mitzi, uh, Mindy Pels quoted, the man's brain produces six times as much estrogen as the female brain. Yeah. Because we're getting it from the ovaries. We're getting our estrogen from our ovaries, so our brain doesn't need to produce it. Is that correct? Do this, no, there a... Um, a circulating level of estrogen in the male brain, probably testosterone to estrogen conversion, which would be interesting compared to female brain. So um, um, as far as production, so that's fascinating. So what about, what about progesterone in the brain? Because let me tell you, Lisa, why this is such an important area for me. Because when I started working in bioidentical hormones more and more as a young gynecologist, one thing that I recognized was that, you know, after like, again, when a woman have, a women have hysterectomies, we were told as gynecologists, well, they don't need estrogen, they don't need progesterone because they don't have a uterus, right? Yeah, right. But progesterone is brain protective. It's in our fascia, it's in our vagina, I mean, it's in our bones. I mean, we need progesterone, there are progesterone receptors all over our bodies. Yes. And so I started using progesterone in women who had had ophorectomies or hysterectomies with their ovaries removed. And, um, and they would always tell me, Dr. Anna, they'd come back in like two weeks, six weeks, Dr. Anna, I feel like a cloud has lifted. I feel like a cloud has lifted. They would say that over and over and over again. And that's without using estrogen. And certainly there's some peripheral conversion, but I yeah. found that so incredibly fascinating. I, I agree. We, there's a lot of research done on the effects of progesterone with pregnancy, right? How the need for progesterone and uh, the activation of the rest of the receptors for progesterone really change before and after and during, of course, pregnancy. And um, in cases of psychiatric disorders, in cases of depression, and for traumatic brain injury, right? 
progestin is really needed, both estrogen and progesterone are really needed for recovery after a TBI or a concussion in women specifically. So yes, I, I think there's so much that we don't know that is incredible. It's just incredible. Actually, when you, when you mentioned that, yes, the reason that women with a hysterectomy uh, only get estrogen is really because of, of um, considerations around cancer, not considerations about, around women's well-being. Right, so we're just trying to avoid cancer occurrence, but we're not optimizing for brain health. And it's just so not right. It's incredible. You are absolutely right. So let's, uh, let's close with some of your favorite foods from your book, yeah. Brain Food, that yeah. um, we should be eating on a, on a regular basis or we should think about incorporating. Yes, After yes, our yes. trip, or you know, not to mention a trip to Italy to really a, <laughs> a good, holy uh, Mediterranean diet. Yes. So I think um, everybody knows the vegetables are really good for you. So dark leafy greens and other greens like broccoli, cabbage, anything green is basically good for you because this. Uh, these veggies really contain vitamins and, and minerals and phytonutrients that are so important, especially for the immune system. They really boost your ability to uh, ward off disease to the point that um, there are big studies showing that even just eating one salad every day can keep your brain younger by as much as 11 years. So I think that's a strong reason to do that. Plus, of course, they're a fantastic source of fiber. And fiber is especially important for women's health because fiber has a modulatory effect on the sex hormone binding globulin, right? SHGB, which is, the, which is the molecule that really regulates estrogen levels in the body and blood and in the brain probably as well. So that's another good reason to do that. Um, I'm going to say fruit. I don't know how you feel about fruit in the context of your, of your diet. Do you allow it? Do you say maybe avoid it? I, I say there's, uh, you know, fruit is something essential to have during your feast days. Like I don't villainize any food, but okay. there's time and a place because fruit will, for the most part, especially in perimenopause, kick us out of ketosis. But low glycemic, like I can have a handful of blueberries or some sliced strawberries, but I can't eat a slice of watermelon and stay in ketosis. And I rather right. stay for my glass of wine. So, so <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Trade-offs. I see. Trade-offs. But yeah, definitely, so, especially in the summer, we're coming, you know, where there's watermelon and there's beautiful fruits and I mean, yeah. seasonal fruits, it's a season. It's not all year in most cultures, right? That's so, true. but yeah, but again, I'm definitely pushing, um, especially the perimenopausal, menopausal woman into ketosis, but you flex, you flex in and flex out. So yeah, love it. Okay. So, so, well, I was going to say that in the Alzheimer's field or in the brain aging field, um, fruit is actually recommended, especially the low GI fruit, like berries, like you mentioned. So blueberries, raspberries, strawberries. And, um, and that's mostly because they, they contain good amount of, a good amount of antioxidants. So in that light, everybody is aware that blueberries are very good for you, but in reality, blackberries are better they have a higher antioxidant um, power. They have a higher auric density. So they're more antioxidant, so they're more anti-aging. And this is the season, they're cheaper now, so it's a good time to, you know, this summer. Uh, goji berries are also good sources of antioxidant and they're perhaps the most concentrated source of vitamin C. So just a little handful goes a long way. Um, my daughter loves them. It's incredible. Ever since she was like two years old, one time I think she had an indigestion. <laughs> she was <really> like, "Goji berries." It was hysterical. Um, so we talked about antioxidants and fiber. Omega three fatty acids are really important for brain health, including women's brains. So studies that looked at women specifically, and I go into much more detail in the, the XX brain really looks at diet specifically for women, but uh, so basically trans-saturated fats 
increased risk of heart disease in women by 33%, which is a lot. And also they really increase, um, so people who eat more than two grams of transaturated fat every day have twice the risk of dementia as compared to people who minimize these bad fats in your diet. And the best way to avoid them is to stay away from processed food. I think everybody agrees that processed food is not good for you. So that, you know, smoking's got to go and processed food as well. And then pretty much whatever else you're, you're eating is, is better for sure. Whereas polyunsaturated fatty acids, especially the omega-3, the anti-inflammatory omega-3 ones are very helpful to the health of your heart and the health of your brain, especially as a woman, they've been shown to reduce the risk of heart disease by 25% or higher. And they reduce risk of Alzheimer's by up to 70% as long as you're eating enough. So more than three grams per day mm -hmm. from different sources, mm -hmm. right? And um, they've also been associated with a lower risk of depression in women, uh, lower, lower risk of postpartum depression as well, mm -hmm. and also better reproductive life in general. So basically they really help your hormones. So they're very important to have them in your diet, I think, as a woman. So fish, seeds, nuts, veggies, um, extra virgin olive oil is a really good source of both polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acids and also antioxidants all blend in, which is great. So a nice punch of vitamin E and all the good nutrients. And it tastes really good. And then, I'll, well, we talk about chocolate, but um, I would say water. I realized that when I was talking with Dr. Perlmutter, he's the first one who made me notice how, for me, it was a no-brainer that you have to drink a lot of water. But he was like, a lot of people don't really stress the importance of water. And why is it so important for your health? And um, the answer is that 80% of the brain is water, mm. which is a lot. It's a lot more than in the rest of the body. So it's the one organ that really contains the most water. And water is needed for every single chemical reaction to take place inside the brain. Everything need, needs water, not just for volume, but also really to trigger chemical reactions like energy production cannot happen unless you have water molecules in your mitochondria. So you need to have both. And so what happens is that the brain is the one organ in the body that is really sensitive to dehydration. So even mild dehydration, like a 2% water loss, can actually trigger neurological symptoms, like dizziness, confusion, brain fog, um, even memory disturbances. Like you, I can't remember anything when I'm not hydrated. And of course, different people have different sensitivities, right? But in general, um, dehydration has been associated with brain shrinkage. Mm. as we can see on MRI scans, like your brain is kind of a sponge. Mm. So if you don't give it fluids, it'll, it'll kind of like, eh, kind of compress and then it'll dilate back as you rehydrate. That's so amazing. Important. Yeah, yeah, it is actually, it is incredible. You think of that, you know, just thinking of back into neuroanatomy classes, you know, the brain is that spongy, you yeah. know, spongy, very watery, and that, you know, that actually we can dehydrate it. That's yes. phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Easily. Yeah, it's like a jellyfish, right? When you think about the jellyfish, they can like go poof, poof. Kind of <laughs> it's kind of like that. <laughs> but the reason I, I bring it up is that um, everyone, ev so many people in the United States drink purified water. And that is not hydrating. That's fluid. So the brain doesn't just need something wet. It needs um, electrolytes. So the water hydrates you beca because it contains minerals and salts that are like the function in an in electrolyte capacity and really um, provide the sodium and potassium and manganese and all these different nutrients that allow rehydration in the body. So purified water is clean, no arguments, but it doesn't contain any of the nutrients. So it doesn't rehydrate you. So tap water is actually better unless you live in Flint. <laughs> yeah, right. No, yeah, yeah. I write about that in my book too. Mm -hmm. so, 
So what water is, so because you think of the chlorinated and fluorinated waters, you know, you can't yes. that. Can no, you need to make sure you don't get the toxins part. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want the toxins, but you want the nutrients. So it, I think it really depends on where you live. Like in New York, we have very good tap water. It's clean because the, the city filters the water for impurities, but it also retains most of the nutrients. Uh, spring water is totally fine. Mm -hmm. The spring water, everybody says to me, you know, it's expensive. And then like, but I'm not saying that you should drink Evian, you know, right, right. some fancy $6 a bottle water. There's, there's spring water or mineral water that is not, is cheaper than soda. Yeah. So if you can afford to buy soda, then you may as well swap for water and just do your brain a favor. So what about alkaline water? I'm not so sure about that. Sure. And then what sure. about adding mineral drops? Like I have my mineral yes. salt. I have my salt. Mm -hmm. so sometimes I just put a little bit of the mineral salt in my water. Exactly. That's the other thing. So if you're drinking purified water because you're concerned about impurities and yeah. toxins, that makes perfect sense. But then you do need a supplement. Yeah. So actually, I don't, did, do you make them? Is it, one, is it part of your line, the mineral drops? No, not yet. Ah, <laughs> a good idea. Next one. <laughs> next next one. One. Yeah. Well, you know, Everybody asks me for a good brand. So if you, if you end up making them, let me know. Um, I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking about it because I do all the time. Like I make this concoction in my water <laughs> that is so good. And um, yeah, that, that definitely makes a difference. And yeah, I, that is good. That is good advice. So you've given us so many great, great pearls. These, I'm just so grateful for you sharing your information. I'm excited for this book, that brain food, and then your XX factor, the XX brain. XX brain. XX brain. XX brain. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, me too. I, I'm so really, good. I'm so happy that I got to do that. I'm uh, really trying to help women as much as I can. It's really, it's always been my, my passion, just women's brains health and um, you know, when I started, really nobody cared. Nobody cared. There was so much pushback, like, oh, you know, women just live longer, women just have hormones, and women complain. And, and now, finally, the field has come around, and we, we were able to get a number of grants from the, from the government, from the NIH, oh. to look into women's brains. We have foundation grants to look into women's brains. There's so much more... So many scientists have come together to really denounce this gender bias, not just in medicine, but specifically in neurology and psychiatry, which I think is really is needed. Is, is really needed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, from the different disciplines. Yes. And we the need media as well has been really incredibly supportive. Like the Wall Street Journal wrote about their work just recently. Uh, the New York Times wrote about it, the Los Angeles Times wrote about it. So it's really, I think there's so much more awareness for now and there's so much more desire for information and so many more women are really demanding the information. And I think that's the biggest driver of really good work. And yeah. And the endocrine field, we need to get more involved in this. Like it is so crucial. The Please come help. Brain. I'm coming. I'm coming on the next flight. I will be there. I want to meet your beautiful daughter building a city, a blooming architect. Beautiful. <laughs> you know, she wants to be a brain scientist. She'll sit in my lap every morning and we look at brains together and I'll just change the color so that she, you know, there's a rainbow thing that she can do. And, but she knows, she knows like, oh, that's the frontal cortex, mommy, and show me the hippocampus. So it's there. It's oh, really weird. How old is she? She just turned four. Oh, my gosh. All right. A budding genius. Oh, <laughs> hey, we need more XX brain researchers. Yeah. So awesome. Well, I thank you so much for your time today. And I am so grateful for all the work you're doing in this field. And um, I'm going to, I would love to have you back. And especially when your next book comes mm. out, I'm I would love to, I would I love to. Our, I know my audience is soaking this up and I'll tell everyone where to get you. So Lisa Moscone, <laughs> L-I-S-A-M-O-S-C, 
O N I. Get it right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, and, and you're on Facebook and you're on Instagram. And so we Instagram. can follow your work, but plus your blogs and your recipes that are there are all everyone there keto green approved. So many of them are. And so you can you can look at those. Like I'm gonna get the dark chocolate recipe from you to add. <laughs> so good with the rose petals. Mm, with so the rose good. petals, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's perfect. And, uh, and we'll bring you back for the XX factor. So for our listeners today, you know, I just want to thank you for tuning in, you know, that this is information that you've got to share. So please share this information and share with me what you've learned what your aha moment is, and whether you're listening on podcast or I, uh, podcast addict or iTunes, check out the video too, because we put up some great slides that I think just for me, you know, I, I love looking, looking at those images to kind of hone in how important this is and how much is in our own control. So share Couch Talk with your friends. Give us a rating on iTunes and Podcast Attic and definitely share this message from Dr. Lisa Moscone and keep an eye out for her books coming up in the future and her current book, Brain Food, that's out right now that it's a must get. So I want to thank you all for being here today. See you next time on Couch Talk.